services within the scope of our volunteers. We want to especially thanks, take a moment to thank our sponsor, Triply Construction. And also we, um, we recently were given a Resilience and Response Fund grant, which is a partnership between the Latino Community Fund of Washington, Yakima Valley Community Foundation, and the United Way of Central Washington. We're very grateful for that support. This afternoon, we are very pleased to welcome Colin Fogarty. And he's going to tell us about confluence, history, living cultures, and ecology along the Columbia River. Colin's the executive director of the Confluence Project. And I've actually visited one of the project's sites at Sacagawea Park in Pasco. And uh, some of us are hoping very much that our group might be able to take a Confluence road trip when that is safe to do. And I hope that by the end of Colin's presentation, you'll be as excited about that idea as I am. So think about that as you learn more about the Confluence Project. Chrissy's going to talk about a few logistics, and then we're going to let Colin take over the, the, the afternoon. So Chrissy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, we'll go ahead and stay muted during the uh, presentation just to, so we don't hear any background and echoing. Um, we are recording, so as we always do, for our um, to keep on our website. So thank you. If you don't want your image on the recording, just go ahead and stop your video um, and turn off your camera. Uh, so if you do fall off, as we call it, um, you can just get back on by going back to the link in your email. Um, I'll send an email afterwards with some a feedback survey. And, um, and also if we have other information to send out um, regarding anything we might learn this evening with Colin. So thanks a lot, everybody. Um, enjoy. Mary Lou, you're muted. <laughs> Unmute. Welcome, welcome, Colin. We're really pleased to have you. Sure. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate this opportunity. So is that my cue? Should I just go ahead and get started then? Okay. So uh, thank you all. Um, as you know, my name is Colin Fogarty and I'm executive director of Confluence. And we were talking a little bit earlier as people were getting on the call that um, my history, my professional history is really in public radio. I uh, got a job at Oregon Public Broadcasting at the age of 22 and uh, stayed there for 20 years. Um, for 13 years as a, as a public radio reporter, I covered a lot of politics, a lot of controversial issues. And, um, and then my last seven years, I was a regional editor for um, a, a team of reporters that um, covered stories for 12 stations throughout Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. And I continue to do stories after that. But one of the things that I really noticed, and I think that any writer or any reporter, at some point, you, you sort of get a sense of what you're most interested in. And there were plenty of times when I was covering the Oregon legislature where I'd come home and my wife would say, well, what was your story today? And I was like, um, some committee, some sort of vote on a bill, what was it? I don't remember, it seemed very important today, but it's not important to me now. So there were plenty of stories like that, but um, I found myself really coming back to stories about history and about um, particularly the history of the Columbia River. And there was one story in particular that stuck with me and it is a story about this place. And, if you can recognize this, this is um, this is uh, the Columbia River, um, about 11 miles east of the Dalles, Oregon, or um, across across from uh, Witch Ram, Washington, and this is where Celilo Falls once roared. And Celilo Falls, as many of you may know, um, was a center of commerce, a center of spiritual life, a center of civilization, really, since time immemorial, um, in archaeological terms, at least 16,000 years people lived and fished there. Lewis and Clark called it um, the Great Mart because there was so much trading there. Um, more water flowed over Celilo Falls than flows over Niagara Falls. And in the spring, it's, it's as much as six times more water flowed over Celilo Falls as flowed, uh, uh, flows over Niagara Falls. 
And as many of you, uh, I'm sure know, the Dalles Dam was constructed in 1957 and flooded um, Salilo Falls and silenced that roar. So this story, um, you know, in the 50th anniversary happened in 2007. I did a documentary about it. Um, really struck me and it was very profound. And it struck me that this was easily the most um, culturally relevant, historically most important place along the Columbia River and possibly in our region. And yet so few people that I knew um, actually knew anything about Salilo Falls. Like a lot of people don't, can't even pronounce it, don't even know how to pronounce Salilo. So um, this story really struck me, but more importantly, what struck me was that how, um, how few people really understood a lot of this history. And it seemed to me that it was important that people understand this history, that people understand more about the Columbia River um, and what, what, how this place developed. And so that's why I was drawn to, to Confluence when this opportunity came up seven years ago and I started as executive director. So Confluence is a community supported nonprofit and our mission is to connect people with the history, living cultures, and ecology of the Columbia River system through Indigenous voices. And it began in 2002 with this man, Anton Minthorn, who at the time was the, uh, the chair of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation in Eastern Oregon. And in 2002, there was a lot of talk and a lot of preparation and a lot of discussion about the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. What was going to happen? How are we going to address it? Um, there was widespread consensus pretty early on that tribes needed to be at the table and that it wasn't necessarily a celebration of Lewis and Clark, but a, but a commemoration, an opportunity to really look back. And Antone felt very strongly that tribes needed to be at the table and that the tribal perspective on that story needed to be front and center, that he didn't want to see a repeat of the myth that somehow Lewis and Clark discovered this place, a myth we all know is, is not true. Um, and he wanted um, people to not only understand that, that Lewis and Clark visited this place and met people, but that the descendants of the people Lewis and Clark met are still here and have a story to tell. And from his perspective, the Umatilla tribe was back. Like they're the biggest uh, uh, employer in Umatilla County. Um, and they have a, a, an economy that is really growing. And he wanted that story to be told as part of the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. And meanwhile, our founding director, Jane Jacobson, um, I often ask people, does anyone know Jane Jacobson? Has anyone in this group ever met her before? You'd remember if you did. She's one of these forces of nature, you know, just a real dynamo that has... Um, just endless energy to get things done. And we have a running joke where she says, well, confluence came to be because it was meant to be. And my response to her is always, no, confluence came into existence because you willed it so, Jane. Um, she's one of those folks. And she did the impossible, as I'll, I'll, I'll explain in building these sites. It was very important to Jane that the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial um, not just include symposiums and books and um, and events, but artwork built into the landscape to remind people of this story, of this history. So both Antone and Jane independently, um, without talking to each other, came up with the, the idea of approaching this woman, uh, Maya Lin, who is the artist behind the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, DC. World renowned, um, celebrated artist. And they both felt that she was the artist that needed to be part of the Bicentennial that needed to create artwork along the Columbia River system. And there's this funny story about how Antone called the head of the, um, the Washington Historical Society, David Nicandri, and said, I've got this idea. We need to ask Maya Lin to be part of this. And he just started laughing. And he said, you know, you need to call Jane Jacobson because she called me just yesterday about the same idea. So Antone and Jane got together and they, uh, you know, it's a, it's a long story to approach Maya, but the long and short of it is that Maya wasn't the least bit interested in commemorating Lewis and Clark. And she wasn't, um, uh, she certainly wasn't interested in celebrating Lewis and Clark. And there's a funny story years later about how um, as these artworks were being developed, a reporter kept asking Jane, well, what's the art gonna be? Well, we don't know yet, it's in development. Well, what, you know, is it gonna be a sculpture? Is it gonna be a painting? Is it gonna be a landscape? She's, I don't know, I'm not really sure. And she got frustrated and finally she just said to the reporter, well, I know what it's not going to be. It's not going to be a statue of two white guys pointing west. And of course, that's the quote that ended up in the paper. 
Um, and she tells that story like it's, you know, it was a failure. I actually think it was, it was funny and, um, and important, right? Um, because that's what, that's what Maya was not interested in that. But what she was interested in is the Lewis and Clark journals. Because this was an exquisite document that, that documented and recorded and reported the people that Lewis and Clark met, the flora and fauna that they drew, um, the species, the animals, the fish, the ecology. This was a recorded moment in time that could be a reference point to look back 200 years as a way of looking forward 200 years. It's not that Lewis and Clark discovered this place, it's that they took exquisite notes. And so that's, that what, that's what became the general focus of, of Confluence is, is what do the Lewis and Clark journals tell us about what this place looked like in, in 1805, 1806, and who were the people that they met? So um, over the next 15 years, um, uh, it, there was a series of meetings and consultations and research and six sites were decided on for the artwork. Um, and I'll go through each one of these sites, but if you look on the left-hand side of your screen, it's the mouth of the Columbia River at Cape Disappointment. Uh, and then as we go move east along the uh, Columbia River, we see the Confluence Land Bridge at Fort Vancouver. We see the Bird Blind uh, at the Sandy River Delta where the Sandy River meets the uh, Columbia River. Um, it, further east, you see the, where the Snake River meets the Columbia River in Pasco, Washington and in, uh, um, in Tri-Cities there. And then the furthest east, eastern site is at a place called Chief Timothy Park um, at, at the, the confluence of the Snake River and El Poet Creek. And you see a pattern there. The idea was we know the significant places of, for Lewis and Clark, where they camped, where they had their you know, big meeting, where they suffered uh, greatly in the weather at Dismal Niche. You know, we know about these places, but what are the places that are significant culturally, economically, historically, to tribes and to native people. And they tended to be confluences. They tended to be where pla uh, places where rivers came together because those were the highways of the time. That's how people traveled uh, long before Lewis and Clark came down um, this river in, in their dugout canoes. So um, that's how the name came to be Confluence, the Confluence Project, because these tended to be confluences, but it also took on a deeper meaning too as a metaphor that if, if the, the fundamental story of our region is not discovery, what is it then? And um, what the project came to signify and to mean is that this is a story about confluence. This is a story, our history is fundamentally a story about people coming together, about cultures coming together, about histories coming together for better or for worse. That is our story. Our story is people traveling here, being here, and coming together in some way in, in, in a confluence, if you will. So uh, I'm going to go through each one of these sites if I can get the thing to work. There it is. Okay. So the first thing I want to say is Cape Disappointment is a terrible name. Uh, I promise if you go there, you will not be disappointed. Um, it is a lovely place. And there are a series of artworks there, if I can get this thing to move. There it is, including a fish cleaning table. Uh, made of solid basalt that, as you can see there, is a working fish cleaning table. If you can come off the bay with your salmon and fillet it right there. Um, there is also a platform, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but I do want to also mention the, um, uh, there are pathways uh, along the way uh, that, that retrace the steps of Lewis and Clark, but also um, recount a blessing uh, from the Chinook Nation. But I want to talk a little bit about that second piece right there, you see it's a platform. And there are a lot of people who go to this place, it's down a path and you come to a uh, it's kind of a patio or a deck that is beautiful and elegant and has a um, etched into the, that long piece of metal there is a quote uh, from the Lewis and Clark journals describing this handsome bay as, as William Clark wrote about it and how it was an estuary where the salt water came in, it was tide water and, uh, and the river came. This is where the Columbia River meets the, the Pacific Ocean and how the waters intermingle and how that's a special uh, kind of estuary. And a lot of people come to this place and say, wow, this is a artwork by a famous artist, Maya Lin. Like it just looks like a, just, it looks like a, a platform. Um, and, and that's it. 
actually. And that is Maya's point is that the art, it's not about the artwork, it's about the place. And so what she designed is a place and before, before there, there were a bunch of bushes obscuring the, the waterway or the, the, the waterfront there and you couldn't really see. So she tore out all those bushes, put in this platform and it's an invitation to sit and look at the place, look at the river and absor observe uh, the place in which you're living and which you're visiting and think about the history of that place and what it looked like 200 years ago and what it might look like 200 years from now. So Cape Disappointment was the first site. It was completed in 2006. And in 2008, the Confluence Land Bridge was completed. This is the only artwork along the Confluence series that was not designed by Maya Lin. It was instead designed by an architect named John Paul Jones, who is native and who is in Seattle. And as you'll see, this is a, uh, a bridge, literally a footbridge over Highway 14. And it had to be done by an architect. Maya Lin is a designer and an artist. But because this is a bridge over a freeway, it needed to be done by an architect. So John Paul Jones uh, was brought in to, to design this um, with artwork by the native uh, artist Lillian Pitt. So what you see there on the left is a, a, is a welcome gate with oars from a canoe reminding people that this is canoe country, that the Chinookan people who lived here um, uh, were among the best uh, boatsmen and, and canoe riders that Lewis and Clark had ever seen, not just on their journey, but in their entire lives. Um, and the, 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 the glass cast face there that is in the, the, the oar is uh, meant to honor the Chinookan women. You know, one of the mistakes that the British traders made when they sailed down the Columbia River in the 1790s is they said um, to the people that they met, we want to trade take us to your chiefs. And the response was always, well, if you want to trade, you need to talk to the women because it's the women among the Chinookan people that actually handle the trade. Um, and there are all kinds of documented stories about just how rough they were as negotiators. They were really, really tough. And Lewis and Clark complained bitterly <laughs> about uh, how difficult it was to negotiate with the Chinookan people. So uh, moving east to the Confluence Bird Blind, again, at the confluence of the Sandy River and the Columbia River near Troutdale, Oregon, is literally, and this was designed by Maya Lin, this is literally an outdoor room. Um, and it's at the end of a 1.2 mile hike. So it's not off, just off the freeway or off the parking lot. It, it, you have to hike to get there. And um, walking through the Sandy River Delta, which is a 1500 acre um, restoration project. It's a wetland, but it's also uh, one of the biggest restoration projects in the country by the Forest Service and a whole coalition of, of environmental groups working to bring this landscape back to what it, what it was when Lewis and Clark were still here. This artwork is meant to uh, celebrate that restoration, but it's also a reminder. It's a reminder of what the landscape looked like when Lewis and Clark um, passed through here. And the way that the artwork does that is this room this, uh, ellipse, this room in the shape of an ellipse is lined with wooden slats. And each one of these slats um, has a, a, a documented on it um, species that Lewis and Clark um, recorded on their westward journey. So there are 130 slats and each one of them includes a bird, a fish or an animal that Lewis and Clark documented, what date they, uh, they documented that, what the scientific name is of that particular species and then here's the kicker. The top part of this list for each one of these species uh, documents its environmental status today. So what you're looking at is, an, is in a sense, a, an index. It's an index of the lush landscape that Lewis and Clark uh, documented and, and came through and how many of those species that they documented are endangered, are extinct, are threatened, are species of concern. So it's, it's a gentle reminder that we have changed the landscape. Um, but to me, it is a hopeful reminder because as you look through these slats, you are looking at nature and you are experiencing a, a restoration project that is a beacon of hope. And it's a reminder of what the landscape can be if we take care of it. So uh, moving east again, and now we're in Pasco, Washington at the Confluence Story Circles. And this is the, the site that was referenced earlier. And this is uh, literally a series of, of circles 
made of basalt built into the landscape. Some of them uh, rise above the, the ground, some of them are sunken into the ground. And they're designed to remind people of the native stories. When Lewis and Clark came through there, there was one, one part of it that, that I really love uh, and that is that when Lewis and Clark came to the confluence of the Snake River and the Columbia River, they were, they were disappointed. And the reason that they were disappointed is that they uh, thought they were on the Columbia River already, but they were instead on the Snake River and they had just come to the Columbia River. <laughs> so, but, but the main thing is that uh, when they visited this confluence, it was a bustling place. There were literally thousands of people there um, and so this artwork, and if you go there now, it's a very sedate, very peaceful um, state park. It's a gorgeous place um, named for Sacagawea, who was on the Lewis and Clark journey. Um, but these, these artworks are meant to connect you with the native stories, the native values um, of this place and to remind you of that history. So the farthest Eastern site is the Listening Circle at Chief Timothy Park. And it's, uh, it's on the, uh, just above the, on a hillside, just above the Snake River on an island. And it is based on a, a blessing ceremony that was led there by Nez Perce tribal spiritual elders in 2005. And um, in that ceremony, the elders had uh, the women on one side facing one direction, the men on one, another side facing the other direction. Um, and the elders facing east and no one had their backs to the east so that they could welcome a new day. And this was the spiritual landscape that these Nez Perce tribal elders created in this ceremony. And Myelin was so struck by that that she wanted to build that spiritual landscape into the actual landscape. So what she created was a series, again, in the shape of an ellipse, if you look at it from space, um, a series, uh, it's, it's essentially an amphitheater for people to sit. Um, and there's no requirement that men sit on one side or women sit on the other side, but it is a reminder that Nez Perce people have been there since time immemorial. I mentioned, I referenced um, 16,000 years. There's a, um, a archeological site um, not too far from there on the Snake River that was found, it's called Cooper's Ferry. And it was found within the last five years, I think, um, a doc, a found and documented. And that's where the 16,000 year figure comes from. So people have been there for 16,000 years, longer than, you know, I remember my wife and I traveled to Ireland where my people are from. And we were very impressed when, at an archeological site that was 5,000 years old. Well, this is 16,000 years. So, so uh, building this artwork into the landscape is a reminder that this is Nez, th these are Nez Perce homelands and they always have been and that they always will be. So the final site, oh, and forgive me, this was 2015, we had a dedication ceremony there with Nez Perce Riders. Um, and it's really a beautiful, beautiful um, landscape. And if you, one of the things that we like to say about it, of all the confluence sites, this site looks the most like what Lewis and Clark documented. If you read what they wrote about that particular place, pretty spot on, hasn't really changed. There's more, there are houses, there's a geodesic dome like up on the hillside, <laughs> but, um, but for the most part, the landscape uh, looks like what Lewis and Clark saw. So that brings us to the, the sixth and final project. This is the only one that is not yet completed. And this is at Salilo Park. And we talked a little bit about, excuse me, the, um, <clears throat> the, 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 the fishing and the commerce and the activity that, that happened at, at Salilo Falls. And what Maya has designed, I'm gonna go back just a little bit so, so you can see it a little more clearly, is an elevated walkway that is designed to remind the visitor about the fishing platforms that used to be there that would have been, that, that lined all the uh, crevasses of, Sal of Salilo Falls where people could fish. And etched into the, the walkway are native words and a bit about Salilo Falls. And the, the, the quote at the end of the walkway is about the roar of Salilo Falls, the roar that you are not hearing. Uh, there's also an interpretive uh, pavilion and a plaza where you can learn more about Salilo Falls. Um, there are three purposes to this project, and that's a view of it from the river, just an, an artist rendering. Um, the three purposes of the, the Salilo Park project are to educate people about Salilo Falls. This is the thing I got into this for, is so, so that people will know what Salilo Falls was and continues to, to mean. 
um, to honor the indigenous people of the Columbia River system uh, and to strengthen the tribal presence in the public spaces along the Columbia River because there are plenty, there are many, many places along the Columbia River that are public places, but there's very little recognition that it is in fact indigenous land. So, so these are the, the, um, the six sites. This project is on hold and I can talk a little bit about that um, earlier or uh, later if you'd like. Um, but along the way, what Confluence has really evolved into is really an, a, an education organization. Like our, at the heart of Confluence is our sites and bringing people to our sites and helping people uh, connect with this landscape through our sites. But along the way, we really became an education organization because a lot of the native elders that we worked with, a lot of the artists and a lot of the tribes just said, you know, people just don't know this stuff. So in 2007, we started an education program called Confluence in the Classroom. And it was a very simple idea to bring indigenous artists and storytellers and elders and tradition keepers into the classroom to work with kids on art projects or to just tell them stories or to take them on field trips. Like you see Clifton Bruno, who's Warm Springs there on the left, taking kids to uh, the famous petroglyph, She Who Watches. On the right, you see an elder named Linda Mianis, who grew up in Salilo Village. And these uh, kids have built a paper mache uh, model of Salilo Falls. And at the end of that project, they will, uh, they will flood it and destroy it to um, recreate um, what happened in 1957. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, a, a, a particular lesson plan. And Linda is a, you know, she grew up there. She remembers this and her role is to make it real for them. This is not an abstract thing. This happened um, in the place where they grew up. These kids are actually uh, on the right are in White Salmon, Washington, right on the Columbia River. So Confluence in the Classroom is also artwork. So you see like some, uh, we've done um, uh, murals with a Yakima artist there. And there's a drumming project that happened at a school in Portland a few years ago. And as I mentioned, we uh, have included um, field trips as part of this program, and it evolved into what we call Confluence Outdoors, which is a more deliberate way of taking kids outside. Like Confluence in the classroom is one thing, it's important to do that, but we need to get kids to our sites, to this landscape so that they can experience it uh, uh, on their own. I'll talk a little bit about how we've evolved over um, in COVID times. And that is primarily um, through Confluence virtual classrooms. So you see here uh, a Grand Ron educator named um, Greg Archuleta in the upper right hand corner, if you can see his face with his uh, cedar bark hat, that he's teaching kids about dyes, traditional dyes, and how, um, how you can make them from things you find out in, in, in nature. Um, the silver lining in COVID times when kids are at home is that um, we have been able to reach more students, more classrooms, more schools than we ever have before. Um, nothing replaces having Greg Archuleta in the classroom working with kids doing cedar baskets. Nothing replaces having Linda Mianis tell her story in person to these kids and really connect with them on an emotional level. But we have been able to make this transition into online learning um, as kids are doing it, as, as teachers are really searching for this kind of thing, as families are looking for this kind of, of uh, education too. Um, and so the result is that we've been able to really expand and reach more kids. So, um, and in the meantime, and I'm going to start hurrying through this because I think I'm going on too long, but <clears throat> um, one of the things that we discovered and that we have been really told by tribal members and by schools and by teachers is that, you know, teachers need help. They don't know a whole lot about tribal history themselves. They don't know whose homeland they're in or what tribe is closest and what their traditions are, they don't really know. And so we were invited to develop a teacher workshop and that's really grown and evolved. And um, we literally just got a grant from the Oregon Department of Education to do four major cohorts over the next six months um, to help teachers do this work because there are new, mand new requirements in Oregon and Washington to teach tribal history and to bring um, indigenous perspectives into the classroom. And so our role is to help them do it. We don't really write curriculum. Um, that's really up to tribes. But what we can do is really help teachers along the way as they go on their own journey. So, um, and again, um, you know, COVID times, 
we've had to do. This has become the ubiquitous picture of our time, right? A Zoom call. Um, yeah, we've had to do to convert these uh, uh, professional development workshops into um, virtual cohorts. Um, and again, the silver lining: we've had we've reached more teachers this year than we ever have before, or ever would have imagined being able to do in person. So uh, confluence in the community. Um, so as we've been, and you can see these are pre-COVID uh, uh, pictures. Um, inevitably, when I talk to people about um, confluence in the classroom, someone raises their hand and says, this is great. Do you have anything like this for adults? Because I want to experience this kind of thing. And uh, so that turned into confluence in the community or what we call um, confluence story gatherings, right? So, and it's a double meaning. We are gathered to hear stories, but we are also gathering stories together. And um, there are panel discussions um, with uh, native thinkers, writers, and leaders, and they're designed to elevate indigenous voices and in our collective understanding of the Columbia River system. So you see one in Vancouver there on the left, one in Portland there on the right. Um, and again, we've had to make the transition to do this in uh, online. And last November, we had a really well attended program. We had more than a thousand people attend this program with the author uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, who wrote the book Braiding Sweetgrass, which I highly, highly, highly recommend. It is a really beautiful and wonderful book about traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and there you see uh, Emily Washines, who's Yakima and uh, lives not too far from where you are, and her cousin Josiah Pinkham um, talking about history in the landscape and their family and a program that we did with them. And, um, and then finally, we had a program about uh, how, pe how tribes and tribal members are responding to the pandemic. And um, because tribes have a long, long history of suffering from pandemics. And so they have a thing or two to say about resilience. And I'll mention uh, the, the person there in the middle, there are lots of really amazing people that we get to work with, but the, the woman there at the, in the middle at the bottom is Patsy Whitefoot, who's a Yakima educator, and she's on our board of directors. And she really is a, sort of the guiding principle of our um, education program. So uh, of course we have artwork and uh, public art has to be uh, maintained. And so we do a lot of, um, volunteer programs. Um, I'm just now dealing with, there's the bird blind you see in a work party where we had people sweeping it and cleaning it. Um, a few trees fell on the bird blind this last September and thank God we got insurance. <laughs> so uh, we've got, uh, I'm working on filing a claim so that in, in that the, 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 the bird blind itself wasn't damaged but the, but the railway of the walkway was, uh, was damaged. So we have to get those replaced. Um, and you know, there you have a work party at the Sandy River Delta re to repair and, and fix up the, the pathway. But it does kind of get to, and there's one more picture I want to mention here. This is conserving the art at the land bridge. Um, again, pre-COVID times, we had a, a major um, volunteer work party to, to spruce up the land bridge and spread mulch all throughout the native plants there. And that was with a veterans group called the Mission Continues. That's where, what all the blue shirts are. Um, in COVID times, we've, we've been able to do this with smaller groups. Uh, we had to call it all off for quite some time, of course, but in the fall, we had like five different work parties and you had to be in your own pod, you had to be masked, you had to have gloves, and we were able to, to do it. But it does get at the uh, something that I didn't mention at the very beginning, and that is that the original idea of Confluence was to build this artwork and then go away. It was literally, they called it sunsetting, that Confluence was supposed to sunset. But over time, two things happened. We kept getting these invitations and there kept being demand to do these education programs. Um, and two, um, no one was gonna step up to take care of the art. And you know, there are landowners who will, who, uh, for each one of these sites who will mow the lawns and, you know, and pick up the trash. But as far as the artwork goes, you have to have a central organization that, that will literally raise money to make sure that this artwork is taken care of. And if you want it to last for generations, believe me, you have to take care of it. <laughs> so, um, and finally, I just want to talk a little bit about Confluence Online and um, it really, it's our website. It's confluenceproject.org. We've always, we've had a website for a very, very long time, but it's only been in the last year and a half that we've been able to 
um, through a new design and a new elegant way of doing things online to have photo galleries, to have interviews, to have articles, resources, interview excerpts from elders, um, all as a resource, almost like a Wikipedia of the indigenous perspective or indigenous perspectives on the Columbia River system. And, and again, you know, you can spend a long time exploring the, um, the, the, the photo galleries there. You see, um, this was a, a picture taken along the Columbia River at Celilo Falls, which you can see in the background there um, before the falls were flooded, of course. Um, and the, there's Antone, you see on the left um, in a series of interviews uh, and interview excerpts that we do. So, so you can go through the library and just hear these words. And again, it's about elevating indigenous voices and connecting people with the history, uh, living cultures and ecology of the Columbia River system through indigenous voices. And that's the end of the presentation, but I do have like one extra uh, slide here that I just wanted to mention. This is, <laughs> don't know where that came from, but I thought I'd uh, just share that with you. He's been showing up everywhere. I don't know how that little birdie in his mittens. Um, well, all right, everybody. So now we can, um, let's get our questions out, everybody. Hold on here. Larry, I see. Larry, unmute yourself if you've got a question. A couple of things um, I'd like to voice. First, I, I wonder um, if people are aware of uh, the book called Winter Kill by Craig Leslie, uh, a book group I've been read it, and it has a very moving passage describing uh, the inundation of Celilo Falls. And um, probably most of the people on this call have done this, but if you stop everything else and think about what it would have been like for the Native American people to see the water rising and inundating the source of their livelihood. It's a terrible, terrible yeah. thing to contemplate. Chrissy, we can hear you in the background. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention um, and ask uh, uh, is whether uh, the, the history of the Columbia River that you've reached in the uh, Confluence project, project has uh, maybe connected with uh, the, the local geology, geology hero, Nick Zentner, who um, has described in one of his lectures called the Ancient Rivers of the Northwest, how what we call the where we see the confluence with the Columbia was actually did I say salmon? Uh, what we call the snake now was the salmon in, 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 in you know, a geologic time a long time ago. But the snake coming up from the south, I guess, broke through Hell's Canyon and, and connected at Riggins and uh, took over the, the, the older course of the salmon. And uh, we now refer to it as the snake. So um, I think that's a really interesting uh, geology piece of, of what we're talking about today. Yeah, absolutely. The, ge the geologic history of, um, of the Columbia River is truly astonishing and, and really amazing. And every time I go through yeah. uh, the Columbia Gorge, I'm always reminded of the, 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 the Missoula floods and um, just how the forces of nature that are the forces that have um, shaped this place. And, and ironically, it, it seems so, it's so beautiful and it's so um, seemingly peaceful. And yet, um, you know, the, the volcanoes and the spewing of lava that created this landscape must have been hellish. It must have been hellish. And, and uh, the Missoula floods, I think, was described to me one time as the pow over 3,000 years, the power of 600 atomic bombs, I think, if I'm getting that right, that that's the, the power that really shaped this landscape is... is it's really amazing. And I, you know, I have heard of that book that you're describing and I have not read it and Winter Kill and I'll have to go check it out. It's also one other little detail too, um, speaking of books that mention Celilo Falls, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the, the character of 
of the chief, you know, the, the Indian mm -hmm. who is there. Um, he is a Columbia River Indian who talks about the, um, so about what happened in Celilo Falls. And in, in that telling, you know, it, Celilo Falls was a contributor to his, you know, his, his mental illness. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Becky. I have a question uh, about the Celilo Falls. I've always wondered, you know, there was that story uh, about the Bridge of the Gods and mm -hmm. there, there was that slide that created that blockage of the, the uh, what we call the uh, Grand Coulee or the Coulee Dam or Columbia. And, and uh, I, I have always wondered if, if those sharp rocks where they were so efficiently fishing by nets, uh, was that at the, at the same place where all of the slide went and then finally uh, uh, washed away everything except the sharp rocks because some of the other rocks up to and past were smoother rocks. I think that that's a really good point. And, and again, I, I wish I knew more about geology. One thing I'll mention about, about the Bridge of the Gods and, and it's, the, uh, it's near Stevenson, Washington. So it's a little bit farther down river toward the mouth of the Columbia River, uh, but still you know, pretty far east of Portland. Um, and if you if you've ever gone to Stevenson, you know you can see you can really see it. It's like this cliffside, like this mountain that is, you know, one side very old and very clearly like a sharp high mountain, and the other side is just a flat. You know, that clearly just sort of went and, and fell down there. And the one thing that is was truly amazing to me about it is the, the mystery uh, to me when I heard that story is well where did all those rocks go like they really sort of washed away right well it turns out that they did they washed down the river um, you know and over like a um, I'm not going to get it right but it's something like a 20 mile stretch like between uh, you know Stevenson and say Troutdale and when Lewis and Clark were there. And um, up until the 1930s, they called that the Cascades because it was a relatively shallow part of the Columbia River. And it wasn't like the, you know, the, the reason fishing was so important or so, I wouldn't say easy, but the reason it was so effective at Celilo Falls is because the river really narrows there. Like that's what makes it so powerful is that all this water is really sort of rushing through and the salmon have to jump up and, you know, they have to get through and it really made them strong. Well, after that period, or after that part of the river, you know, um, west of what was the Bridge of the Gods, there were th those rocks were still there, and they created the Cascades. In fact, there's a there's a band of the Yakima Nation called the Cascade Band of Yakima um, Nation Indians, and and that's where they were from. Uh, that was a trading area. That was a powerful fishing area, and um, very few people alive saw that or remember that because that was flooded by the Bonneville Dam. Mm -hmm. And those were important fisheries there too. So it wasn't as significant or as big as Celilo Falls, but it was a series of kind of waterfalls. I mean, they were literally cascades created by rocks, created by that big old mountain that just like fell down into the river. Yeah. Colin, can yeah. I wanted to ask, first of all, I think I got, I heard wrong that that on at Celilo Falls where Maya then put the bridge out that there was a sound system on the bridge that <laughs> that's what I was that's what I heard that's wrong right so there was an early and I I should mention that um uh the the walkway the elevated walkway is the fifth iteration of what she proposed <laughs> what she proposes and there was at one point what you're referring to is she had this idea to create a kind of a wind tunnel uh -huh. that would so and, and she, they they actually even spoke with engineers from Boeing uh at, to to have and the tunnel would go all the way from like roughly the freeway all the way to the river and somehow turn the sound of the freeway into the sound of the rushing falls and um and basically you know the Boeing engineers said I, I that's a great idea I don't think it possible <laughs> I don't think it'll work so that didn't come to fruition another um Another thing that she talked about or really wanted to do was to 
um, was to build a glass wall um, into the river itself so that you could literally walk down and have a have sort of an almost like a like a like in a zoo where you can see you know their big aquariums and you can see the the shark coming at you or whatever but in this case you could be you know there would be a a glass wall that you could see the salmon coming by and and possibly even see um Celilo falls because the falls are actually still there you know the army corps of engineers did a sonar study of that area to see whether any of that geology had been destroyed in the construction of uh, the Dallas Dam, because a lot of Indians thought that it was like they heard and saw a lot of explosions. And so the assumption has been that a lot of it was destroyed, but it's not, it's all there. It's all intact. It's some, there's a lot of mud in there and a lot of sand and silt, but it's, it's still there. So she wanted to make it so maybe you could see it. Well, one engineering wise, it would just be, I mean, that's a really big, powerful river and, it was just too costly and too, uh, but more importantly, um, the response that she got from tribes was that it sounded too, uh, what they call disnified. It sounded too like this, not, not respectful enough. And so she really took that and listened to that. And the, the elevated walkway is, a, is an effort to, uh, to really invite um, the visitor to look at the landscape in a different way. You literally walk in a way that, that invites you to look in here, to look there, and to, and to finally come to where the river is and where Celilo Falls still is, but underwater and invisible. Colin, could you just talk a little bit? Didn't she meet with tribal members at each site before she oh, yeah. finalized her? Could you talk about that process a little bit and also tell us and do we know, do you know when that Celilo Falls um, insulation will happen or not yet? Yeah, well, and I think those two questions are actually uh, really related. So, um, and I can talk a, a little bit. So this was, it was before my time, but um, but what I do know is that there, there was a lot of consultation and a lot of history and a lot of meeting and a lot of, um, of thinking and feedback and, um, and listening to tribes, right? I mean, uh, Maya really took this very seriously. And, and I didn't mention this earlier, but you know, one of the things she says to this day is that she only said yes when she understood who was asking, that this was not just Jane wanting art, right? Jane Jacobson wanting artwork in the, in the landscape, that this was tribes and tribal leaders and that they really wanted her to help tell their story. And in order to do that, you have to do a lot of listening. So she did a lot of meeting and a lot of discussion and a lot of consultation at each one of the sites. And all of the sites were completed only when it had full approval and buy-in from the tribes and tribal elders. So that's in large part why the Celilo Park Project is on hold. So uh, this, we went, uh, uh, Jane and Maya went through the same process of consultation and really listening. And in 2011, all four Columbia River Treaty tribes that have cultural connections to Celilo Falls. And those are, of course, you know, the Yakima Nation um, across the river, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, and then the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, which Anton is a, is a member of. And then the Nez Perce tribe, like so, these are the tribes that really, you know, um, have Celilo Falls as their in their their heritage and their history. And the Army Corps of Engineers, um, uh, on paper anyway, owns um, the Celilo Park and manages it. And they said um, they would only uh, move forward with the project um, if all four tribes um, agree. And keep in mind, and, and maybe some of you know this, I don't want to go down a, a road about tribal law and treaties and treaty rights and all that, but, you know, in along the Columbia River to make decisions that, you know, things that happen there, tribes uh, are at a higher level than states in terms of their relationship with the federal government. Like that is a, that is a nation to nation um, relationship. And so if tribes are not on board, the federal government is not going to do it. And so, um, so in 2011, all four treaty tribes through their tribal councils approved the project and approved this design of the project. But um, the Yakima Nation in particular, um, it, their, you know, the, their tribal council uh, turns over a lot. There's a lot of political turmoil that has happened. And there was a new chairman in 2018 and new uh, members of the culture committee. And um, they decided that they did not want the project to move forward. And 
there were some misunderstandings, I think, like there were some people who felt that somehow it would interfere with fishing rights. Um, it's not true. I never understood quite what, where that came from. Um, but the larger issue, I think, is they're twofold. One, as was mentioned, as Larry mentioned earlier, um, this is, this was, Salado Falls is a big deal. And losing the falls is a serious trauma and um, it's hard. And I've experienced this too. And, I, and I've learned myself like, like, oh, let's tell the story of Salado Falls. People need to know it. And, and you know, you have to be really delicate about it um, because it's, it's, you know, it's a very, very important story and it's very traumatic for people. And I think that there was some concern that somehow it would turn into a tourist destination. And of course, our response to that is, well, that's the last thing we want, right? We want people to go there, but for education purposes. And if you go there now, there's, there's, you know, there's a swing set, there's, there's a plaque, you know, there are a few signs, but it's not like there's a serious gap between uh, the significance of that place and how it is addressed publicly. And so when they told the Army Corps of Engineers, when the Yakima Nation told the Army Corps of Engineers that they opposed the project, we, of course, went to all the other tribes and said, what do you want us to do? And each one of them, and it was a very, it was a, it was a really um, difficult process, but it was a really enriching one in many ways because their response was, well, we don't want you to give up the project. Like we still support it. Um, and we like what you're doing on education. So we think you should continue doing that and, um, and just be patient and wait. And you know, if this tribal council doesn't like it, then another tribal council will come along at some point and they will like it. So, so be patient. And you know, I told Maya Lynn all of that and, and her response was, well, you know, we're not on our timeline, we're on theirs. So we'll do it when they're ready. And, um, and that's where we've been. Uh, now, since then, the tribal council has indeed turned over. The, that tribal chairman um, is no longer chairman. Um, we believe that there are more sympathetic uh, voices and ears on the Yakima tribal council. Of course, COVID slowed things down and um, the Yakima nation in particular has been hit really, really hard by that. So that's um, we, you know, it's not been, we, it's not, it hasn't been the right time to really say, Hey, we want to do this art project. Uh, um, so we've been really biding our time and kind of waiting, but I do, my, I am very hopeful that within the next year, we will see some movement on that. The questions. Where is the uh, confluence? Is there, do you guys, do you folks have a headquarters someplace or where do you live for instance? I mean, yeah, so our office is at Fort Vancouver, like right near the, the land bridge. I mean, Jane, our founder, was from Vancouver, so our office has always been there. But um, about seven years ago, after I started, we, um, I, I'd love to take credit for it, but it was really in the works before I got there. We cre um, developed a partnership with the National Park Service. Um, you know, Fort Vancouver is a national park, so they give us a good deal on rent. We have an office space there. It's very painful every time I go in because we're, we're paying a good deal on rent but it's still money out the door and nobody's in the office anymore <laughs> but um but we really do value our partnership with the national park service and we have an office there so that it allows us to have a physical presence there um and i i live in portland like literally just across the river in north portland so it's literally six miles from door to door how big a staff do you have it's six, we're very small. So we have six people, uh, three part-time, uh, three full-time. Uh, but, but I'll tell you that that's literally um, as of January 1st, 2021, um, that, we've had, that we have three um, people working full-time. Previous to that, it was just me working full-time and everyone else working part-time. Um, but honestly, like we've had, we've been able to expand enough in the last year or so through uh, virtual programming that it's been, it, we've been able to do it um, in a sustainable way financially. So, how do you, but we're still how, small. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you raise your funds and so forth? Where, where does the, where did, where does that come from? So, uh, generally, over the over the whole history of Confluence, it's about one third government um, uh, uh, grants. Like, so this, if you look at our whole finances in over nineteen years, the state of Washington is the is the biggest uh, funder because um, 
Former Governor Gary Locke was a big supporter of the project and two of our projects are on state parks. So, um, so government grants have really helped build these projects. Um, uh, it's about one third uh, foundation support. So we get uh, support from the Meyer Memorial Trust and from uh, found, you know, foundations large and small um, throughout our region. Um, and then about one third from, uh, from donors, we call them friends of confluence. And it's some people give $10 a month and other people give $1,000 a year. And it's all kinds of a, a range of things. Um, and, and, and I'll, I'll tell you that the, the, the sort of the, the, the financial sustainability of education programming is very different from capital campaigns. And if you've ever been involved in a capital campaign, they're huge, right? I mean, the bird blind was $1.5 million and the, the land bridge was $11 million. The Celilo Park project will cost us about $7 million. There's their federal finances there with the park and the, you know, redevelopment of the park. But, um, um, but then when you look at an education program, it's much, much, much smaller. And so we've really focused on um, bringing um, small donors in so that they um, have some ownership. And, and that's literally how we are able to survive. Yes, you know, we do get grants, but it's really the friends of Confluence that make it possible. And then I have one more. <clears throat> the, uh, the education program, do you, uh, if a school district wants to have that in their curriculum, how do they go about asking for it or how does that work? Yeah, so it's a, I wish I could say it's a very formal process, but it's literally our education manager, you know, her name is Heather Gurko, and it's just about connecting um, with her. And um, we have been, uh, so, and we have a whole series of grants to support these programs, but we've also discovered that there are a lot of districts that have money to actually do it and are willing to pay for it. And, and that's a very different thing than it was five or 10 years ago. I mean, we had to you know, we had to really lobby to get this program into schools and now there's just so much more demand. And so we have been able to, in a lot of instances, sort of share the costs, like a district or a school will say, um, like the Stevenson School District along the Columbia River, like the way we were able to do that program is that we had some grant money and then they had some money from their PTA. And so we just put it together and we just kind of see what works and see how we can do it. Um, you know, there's a program that we are going to do in Goldendale, Washington, um, and that's funded by the Washington Arts Commission, um, ArtsWA, and uh, they've been a consistent uh, supporter of our education program too. But it really is, I can give you her, her, uh, her um, email too. It's, it's heather at confluenceproject.org if anybody wants to, um, to get in touch with her about her programs. She, by the way, is just recovering from COVID. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just uh, say that is that she's doing a lot better. So she is getting back to people, but I'll just sort of put that out there that her whole family had it. So, so there we go. And Colin, the programs you mentioned earlier, I happened to be able to see a few of them. They were wonderful, but they're available on your site now, right? You can go and watch Robin Wall Kimmerer, can you? You can, yeah. In fact, uh -huh. actually there is a, um, and why don't I find the, um, the link for that too? Like, so it's a, uh, it's a fantastic presentation, you guys. She also spoke at YBC, and I was telling Colin she was great at YBC, but she's particularly spectacular in this site. And she, she talks about, as a Native student, what it was like to become a biologist. It's, it's a, and, and her thoughts on education and how it needs to change to be more inclusive. It's a great presentation. Yeah, it really is. It's really very powerful. and. So I'm going to give you, so that's a link to our live videos and it really is just a series. We also have a Vimeo site. I'm going to, well, for some reason, the top, I'm going to, the, the top. Well, I just, we, I just, you know, Chrissy can probably send that out to you guys when she sends out the uh, evaluation at the end. I, I'm pretty sure she can do that. Chrissy, yeah. is that right? Yeah, yeah I, I can do that. She can send that out to you also. You'll have it on your email. That sounds great. That sounds yeah. wonderful. That'd be great. Was there another question? I thought I saw Larry had one. Yeah. Larry, unmute yourself. Larry, Larry you're muted. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, Colin, it's really nice to see you. I've heard your name for years. We are public radio <laughs> yes. junkies. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've heard you with Public Northwest Radio and uh, Thank you. TV. So your name is as familiar as some of our kids. 
I appreciate the work you've been doing on the Confluence project that the um, Lewis and Clark uh, exploration has just always been dear to my heart. And I've read a lot of stuff. I think the first thing that piqued my interest was um, the uh, Stephen Ambrose uh, Undaunted Courage. Yes. And it uh, prompted me to um, try to uh, look at more of those sites and, and the kinds of things that they saw. Uh, during the uh, bicentennial, uh, we had a chance to uh, go back to uh, Fort Benton, Montana, oh. and float the Missouri River, mm -hmm. the last stretch of the um, um, river that's not dammed or altered. It right. had just been declared a, a wild and scenic area by, uh, I think, President Clinton just before he left office. Mm -hmm. And so we spent five days uh, floating the river between Fort Benton and Judith Landing. Wow. It was fantastic experience. We um, were with an outfitter who um, had outlined um, our route so that every night we spent at a place where Lewis and Clark had camped. Mm -hmm. We were able to read the journals for their entries for that day. Wow. So that, that was exciting. Um, the other thing I did during that time was I um, enrolled in a a class that I believe sponsored by Department of Interior. It was in Salmon, Idaho. And it was a week's uh, course. And part of the adventure was to, they took us across the Continental Divide from Salmon, Idaho into the Three Forks area. Wow. Anna, on the, on the Missouri side and turned us loose with the journals and told us to find the um, most farthest spring, wow. most farthest fountain. Huh. And so um, I was able to, I trucked out through the brush and, and um, um, found this little stream and I thought, I walked up through it for hours and I thought I must be getting close because I was, the stream was getting so small that I could put a foot on each side of it. Ah. <laughs> and I got up close to the top of the Continental Divide and I thought this has got to be it. Yeah. And I found this little spring and looked up and here's a big sign up on the uh, road right above there. I didn't even know there was a road there. And it said most farthest fountain. After I'd hiked through all that brush for hours, here I could have gotten there with a road. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good story. You know, I was going to ask you, did they give you, uh, as they sent you on this, did they give you candles to eat? Because I think that's where uh, Lewis and Clark had to eat their candles, wasn't it? I think I was looking toward horse meat at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure, you know, because I, you know, I, I really got into uh, Lewis and Clark where it was really an entry point for me for a lot of this history, too. I mean, I'm a history nerd, and I just went to a program last night about Sir Francis Drake and how he really landed in Oregon, not in California back in 16, whatever. Um, but anyway, um, which is a great book. I, I really recommend it. It's called Thunder Go North um, by Melissa Darby. But anyway, I What's the name of it? It's called a Thunder Go North, and it's by Melissa Darby, North. and that's about Sir Francis Drake, and that's a different story. But, um, but you know, if if I'm not mistaken, if I'm remembering right, uh, there is a famous story of of Meriwether Lewis at that part where he did literally the same thing, and uh, uh, where he put both of his feet on both sides of the the headwaters of the Missouri River yes. And, yes, and waxed philosophical about what it all meant and, and, and the land and the landscape and America and its history at, at that time. And, you know, Lewis was a, you know, there's a lot of speculation that he was a, he was a manic depressive. I mean, that there were, there were moments when he was very, very, uh, you know, Clark called it melancholy, right? Where he, yes. would, you know, not talk a lot and, you know, um, uh, but there were other times like that when he was there, when he was just like on fire with with what a incredible 
journey they were on. So yeah, that's really great. I'm really glad that you told that story and, and had such a great experience doing that. It was wonderful. Yeah. I'm, I'm um, glad we are still connected, even though we have lost our picture somehow. But um, uh, the Salilo Falls, was that at all connected with the Bridge of the Gods, the slide that fell through the gulch and, and dammed up the Columbia River for about three years? Well, um, so they're at different places. Um, I, I don't know exactly how many miles. So um, uh, Salilo Falls is right near the Dalles. It's like about 11 miles east of the Dalles. And, right. and so the Bridge of the Gods would be like sort of west of Hood River. Um, and I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know the answer. I don't know if anyone that, that knows more about geology than I do, but like when that you know, when that dam came down, like how far would the would the water have been backed up? I mean, I, I don't know the I'm not sure. And how long did it take for those rocks to really just flow through? I don't know. Yeah. Dick Stedner's got a uh, lecture on that. He said the water backed up all the way to the Tri-Cities. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I bet. Yeah. It was really deep. I forgot how many hundred feet deep the, the lake that it produced was. Wow. <laughs> Wow, Sorry, we lost our picture. We're here. <laughs> well, um, I do we have any more questions? I think maybe we have. I, I'm hoping some of you are, are looking forward to the, the safe, uh, the, the safe uh, field trip that we need to take in the direction or guided tour we need to take in the direction of some of these sites and, and uh, see them for ourselves. Uh, Colin, I think your descriptions of the different sites are totally helpful and fun to give us a, a vivid idea of what we might be seeing. Um, yeah, so absolutely. And um, give us a call. Like we're happy to advise and really help out. And we have, um, you know, guides. In fact, actually, by the time you do it, we will have a, an actual brochure that is one of these sort of fold out maps. Great. Uh, believe it or not, people actually cool. still use them and want them. Yeah. Um, but, but this one will have a QR code so you know you can have the map but then you can use your phone to get more resources about how to, how to do that so um, yeah. so while, great. while we're here if it's okay I will put a link in here if you would like to sign up for our newsletter just to sort okay. of um, you know keep in touch and keep up to date we're sending a newsletter out tomorrow I think but we we only do it maybe like once a month or so and it's primarily about events and Sometimes we do what we call story collections, which is, you know, um, collections of resources and things like that. Um, but when we have that brochure, I'm happy to send it to you if, uh, if you want to put your address in um, and, and a note when you sign up. But also um, we have these new um, uh, booklets that we created that's sort of a visual representation of, of all basically the, it's a it's a booklet version of the presentation that I just gave and I'd be happy to mail that to you if anyone's interested but just you know the on that that link that I put in there to our newsletter we can I can you know you're welcome to sign up great great all right well thank you so much this has been a fantastic Good. afternoon for us. No, thank you. I really yes. appreciate the opportunity. Really, thank really thank great. you for listening. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. Remember to hoorah from upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Colin. Thank you very much. I loved yes. it. Thank you. Okay, and I just right. want to quickly let uh, people know about upcoming talks. On February 10th, we do not have a Zoom talk, but we encourage you to join the Yakima Coffeehouse Poets. And we'll send you the link so you can do that at 7 p.m. on the 10th. And on uh, the 24th, we have um, Heidi Shaw from the Yakima Valley College Psych Department talking about chimpanzees and sign language, making science accessible to all students. And that's gonna be a really interesting evening. And then on the 17th, we've got, um, uh, we, we've got some plans for a presentation on the, the tool to discuss and document uh, end of life care choices called Five Wishes that some of you may know about and or may want to think about updating if you've already got one. 
And so that's going to be on the 17th of March and more to come after that. So thank you much for, for joining us today and we appreciate it. Take care. Thanks. All right. Thank Bye, you. Yep. Bye. 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 Thank you. Hi, Terry. Bye, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Inga. Bye, Dick. Bye, Becky. Bye, Shoals. Bye, Bye Kathy. Bye, Bye Ravenna. Bye. All right. Bye, Stovers. Take care. <laughs>